okay, so what is Video Volunteers? First of all, I, I, a caveat, I didn't found Video Volunteers, but I am the CEO. Jessica Mabry is the founder. You can see us on videovolunteers.org. Um, and Jessica and I have uh, some similarities and a lot of differences. We we're both similar in the sense that uh, we both uh, worked in television. Uh, I was at, M uh, at NB uh, sorry, CNBC in London. She was at Court TV, CNN, etc. cetera, um, New York One. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a horrible world and a wonderful world all at once, you know, it's, uh, the television industry. Um, it, it teaches you a lot about discipline and, and not a lot about impact and result. Um, but uh, so she went uh, and spent a lot of time in the developing world about how can we use filmmaking to, you know, uh, you know similar to how, you know, the work that Silas has done. We spent, I, I joined the board, uh, I talked to you a little bit about my background. We spent a while saying, well, what are the big problems in the world and how can our skill sets try and unlock some of those problems? And from our perspective, some of the big problems were that, um, and what, someone mentioned this before, it's not that there aren't solutions in the world. There's, there's a whole room of solutions here in the world. The problem is how do you uh, get to the people who need it the most and how do you get there on, at scale? And reach and scale were the two biggest intractable problems that we, came, you know, that we, we were thinking of which was lucky for us because we're involved in media, and media is all about reach and scale. Um, that, that's ostensibly what it does. Um, and it's been used historically uh, for really good things and really bad things. You know, Hitler comes to mind. You know, the, one of the first really great uses of terrible, you know, impact from, from media. And yet, you know, the education system, um, Sesame Street, you know, there's, the, there's a whole spectrum of, of, of stuff that's gone on uh, using, using, using media. So we were, we were looking at, well, what are the opportunities and what's the model that we can, where we can have a significant impact? So here it is in a nutshell. After a couple of years of hybrid tests and you know, testing and retesting and, and playing and, and, and failing and succeeding a little bit moving forward, we have, uh, we, we're promoting the idea of a community video unit. So we partner with a local NGO who has you know, ostensibly a lot of grassroots activity and is very significantly partnered with the community and is concerned with the voice of that community and that the community has a voice uh, and that the community has uh, community-owned media. So the NGO is not in control, basically. This is, you know, it's not disintermediating them, it's allowing the people who are disintermediated to come up to the, you know, an equal footing. They um, invest some money and some time and some staff and resources. We invest money, time, and staff and resources. The NGO helps us choose five to ten people in a local community. At least 50% of those have to be women um, for us to even start this, this thing, for obvious reasons. And uh, we then provide a trainer for a year. The trainer lives in on site for the first two months and does a boot camp kind of filmmaking course. Um, everything from writing, shooting, editing on a PC um, and producing um, and then supports them for an additional 10 months. Now the reason we support, we do this kind of extensive commitment is because we want these community video units to be in existence in five years. We don't want it to be like a, you know, like a summer camp thing. It, it, it has to be sustainable, it has to be able to regenerate itself and, and we think that that will require more than just a two month boot camp. In fact, we know it does because the ones that we've tried and failed if we, if we pulled out. So at the end of two months, they've produced their first program, which we call a video magazine. Now we taught, um, as Jessica and I worked on cable and you know, the networks a lot, the easiest and most flexible format is that cable you know, um, lifestyle program where you've got vox pop, you've got interview, you've got in-depth, you've got some tricks and tips, you've got maybe a music video thrown in. You know. And so that's what we teach. So we teach very simple interviewing techniques, very simple vox pop, very simple legal, very simple music video, and some styles around that. And that's two months. Interestingly, the hardest piece of all this is teaching people what their genuine voice is and what they really want to say. What impact do you want to have in the world? And what is your voice? These are people who've never had a voice. You know, um, and who don't believe they have a voice. And one of the hardest things for us is finding people in the community that still feel they have a story to tell and still feel like they have something meaningful to, you know, to contribute. And they're the people we're looking for that haven't been totally crushed into the ground, that, that can still say, look at my life, it's been amazing or it's been terrible, but this is my story, it's like perfect. 
you know how to tell a story. So um, these five to 10 people, um, this is where we get into the differentiator around our model. The first thing is that we're, we're not teaching kind of filmmaking per se, we're teaching television. So it's a monthly production schedule and every month these people are gonna produce another program. So it's television. The second thing is there's no point in having a production if no one's going to see it. And distribution is absolutely critical, particularly if you're talking about those four billion people under $4 a day who are in a total brownout or blackout area. They don't get media, they don't read newspapers, they don't get magazines, they probably live under a billboard but never look at it. You know, they don't get television, the internet's like, they don't even know what that is. Um, and some of them may have cell phones, they certainly know what a cell phone is, but a lot of them don't. So how do you get to them? So we, we built into the model um, distribution in it. So of the 10 people, one or two of them are either selected monthly or it's their full-time job. So it's either rotates or it's someone is selected to be the distributor. So we say, okay, this is village, this is your village. Let's pretend that everyone comes from the same village. They don't typically, but let's pretend we, we're producing in this village. So we have, we say, okay, let's draw a circle of 50 kilometers around this village and each of you is a village. We're saying, okay, we're gonna find 25 villages, each of which has a minimum of 1,000 people in it. Now in India, that's a walk in the park. So other countries, it's a little more difficult, but it's very, very simple in India. So you go 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. Reason it's 25 is because there's 30 days in the month minus four Sundays. So you're working six days a week. Um, so, uh, you know, the seven, second sort of differentiator is that the distribution. So the distributor is going out to a village, <laughs> to you, uh, Loretta Village, um, and saying, I, I'm gonna promote that we're gonna, we're gonna show a film, we're gonna show a program on the second Tuesday of every month in your village. So on the second Tuesday, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna bang a drum, I'm gonna get kids behind me, and I'm gonna go out in the evening, set up a widescreen projector, and the entire village comes out and sees it. And it's my job, because I'm the distributor and I have to get you there. And the NGO, if they're worth their salt, is going to say, oh, this is great promotion, because it's basically around the same things that we're trying to achieve, only you're getting what? Scale and reach. Because otherwise, they're door knocking, literally. They're literally going visual, and they don't have time to do that. They've reached the kind of limit of what they can achieve. So they just ride on the back of what the distributor's doing and the community video unit's doing and say, well, while they're showing their film, by the way, let's have a, di a, a dialogue, let's have a debate. So they have a microphone and amplifier and say, let's talk about this, let's talk about child marriage, let's talk about polygamy, let's talk about women in the community, let's talk about witchcraft, that was an issue that came up last month. Let's talk about you know, all these things like health, you know, women's health, you know, et cetera, et cetera, AIDS. And by the way, we have a program that you can get in, or by the way, there's a government program that you saw featured in the film. We, we, we have certain sort of, we're very, as I was telling um, as someone in, in the break, we're very rigorous on um, governance and we're very agnostic when it, comes to, um, uh, when it comes to content. I really don't care what people want to talk about. If they want to talk about how to become rich in India, I'd be absolutely fine with that. But if they didn't go through their editorial board, I'd be absolutely livid. You know, because it's, it's critical to not just, um, you know, good, good processes, but also to safety. You know, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take a genius to realize if you're doing something on child marriage and you're a woman reporter and then you play it back to the village of whom all the women are child brides, you could be creating tension and problems. Uh, and that could have serious health ramifications for you uh, as a producer. So it's very important to go through, a, you know, a rigorous process and that's what we're like in encouraging people to do because that's how you create an industry. That's how you create something that is replicable. Um, the creativity side is, I, I'm totally hands off on that. Um, so that's the second interesting piece and, and uh, on is that distribution is built into the model. Now that's the first piece of distribution which is the local level and that's where we believe that we can accelerate social change. There's two other layers to distribution which I won't talk about a lot because you guys know a lot about it which is the regional national level and we basically buy cable time in India for like $60 um, for two months and we get on Dordeshan and you know it goes out to 11 countries you know, for 50 bucks, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing. And, it's, and, a, and, a, and, the, and the leverage, yes, no, it's not going to the local community, but it's going to the next level up, you know, a couple of levels up. And, but, the, but the reach is, we've gone to 20 million people or 50 million people potentially, of which maybe, you know, let's say 75,000 saw it. Well, our, our goal at the Loretta Village, you know, is, is, you know, to, and all of the vill villages every month, the goal is 10,000 people a month which if you compare that to like the Shakti system or the self-help group system is like an exponential leap. 
you know, from, because those are great systems, they're kind of like Avon lady systems, you know, which are wonderful and they're very effective, but they have, again, they hit their limit. If I'm, you know, a self-help group leader, I have a limit of this, and I can only do this once or twice a day. Whereas if you do a, you know, if you add media onto that, you can exponentially increase that. So we do the regional, national, and then we do international. So we're doing deals with like Link TV, Current TV, um, you know, film festivals, uh, of course the internet. We're doing a distribution deal with Google, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that stuff is on the international side. So that's distribution. And then the third differentiator, and I think this is absolutely critical, is that all of our community producers, as we call them, so these are local people from local communities. Some of them are illiterate, some of them are Ill illiterate. We have community groups that are half Muslim, half Hindu. We have an all woman group. We have an all youth group. We have an all Dalit group, all Dalit meaning untouchable uh, Dalit group. So it's very diverse. We have a tribal group. Um, so it's all tribal people from uh, a, a region in India. It's very diverse groups. Um, every one of them is paid. These are not, and, and, you know, the first thing you can say is why are you call video volunteers. Well, we're going to change our name. So we're in the process of a rebrand, but everyone is paid. Because typically, you know, um, th it's not uncommon for these, pe you know, for people to, to set up something like this and expect a woman who has three kids, her husband's died or left her and she's ill to volunteer her time. She's like, what time? I don't have time. I spend half, you know, I, I, I collect rags for a living. You know, um, or I'm a manual scavenger, or you know, stuff like that. I mean, this is a horrific opportunity. So this is a great opportunity for livelihood, um, at a comparable level to you know something in the community that's really a significant, you know, but not a, an enormous leap up, but like a, a really good, you know, first, second quartile kind of jump up for them. Um, so it's a livelihood for them, and we're looking for long-term commitment and long-term cycles, so that 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 the community video unit is, is stays in production. And they're three kind of like critical things for us. Um, and this triumvirate of community video unit who owns all the media, NGO who is very is critically supportive of, of, of the process, and you know, video volunteers um, who have the process and the, and the mechanism, uh, and the distribution model as well, um, is critical. If any one player drops out, the whole thing falls apart. We don't control this thing. We just have a mechanism that allows people to participate in it. If the community producers decide not to produce, then we, we're lost. If, if we pull out, the, everyone else is lost. If the NGO is not supportive, all the trust falls out. So it's, it's a really critical house of cards, and we like it that way because it means that no one's really in control. Um, everyone has an equal, an equal play. You know, and as I said you know, in, the introduc in my introduction, our goal is really to create a, you know, an industry of of, of media professionals, of, of journalists, of participatory media, you know, community participants, where they have um, they have a say in their own in, in their own community. They actually have a voice. I mean, the most important thing you know that I heard back when I went to India recently is that they just have a voice. That someone would even want to hear what they have to say is just so shocking to me. It's like, but it's amazing and it's really revelationary when you see that. So some of the things that, that have come out of the first round of magazines, we have seven community video units now uh, and we're looking to more than double that in the next 12 months. Um, uh, we have, you know, drama coming out. People are attempting, you know, really interesting drama, which I was ex explaining in the break, is kind of like halfway between an infomercial and days of our lives, <laughs> you know, and the people are plucking out, but it's like made by Vittoria De Sica. You know, they're plucking out people out of factories and villages and asking them to act out something. And they're really wonderful. It's like, I didn't know about that government program. Really? Let me tell you. You know, it's like, but it's fascinating. And then, of course, you know, there's all the Bollywoody style stuff that goes on, which is really fun to watch. And, and comedy where, you know, you ask a group of people from a village or the community video unit of, of whom no one's ever asked their opinion, let alone how to make a f television. You, you're in charge of the humor section because we, we say a humor section is good. It's a big deal because you make people laugh, they, they really love it. And you have to write a joke. Well, there's a new disease in India called chikungunya, which is a lot like malaria. It's actually a strain of malaria. And people thought it was chickenpox, but it was not. And it's, it's, I didn't, I'd never heard of it, but it's new and it's out there and everyone's getting it. Um, and so they said, you've got to write a joke about chikungunya. And it was like, so th this one guy, had to, he had three hours on his own and he was trying to nervously to write, you know, a joke. And, you know, it's hard. I mean, writing a joke is hard. And in the end, you know, 
they, they, were, you know, they, they came up with these like two mosquitoes, you know, and so they, they did this thing between two mosquitoes and that was, they played it out and it was a joke and it was really funny and everyone really liked it. But, you know, that's difficult because you're really crossing, you've got to try and really cross boundaries. All the training's done in local language. They're all local trainers that we, we find and train. And they tend to be either people from the film industry or television industry who want to jump into doing something meaningful or people have just left college and they want to jump into something meaningful. And this group helps each other. And so from an organizational perspective, just jumping out for a second, I think about this on multiple layers. So we have community producers who are really virally spreading messages of hope um, out to their communities and asking the community. There's a minimum of 100 people who have to be interviewed to put a program on. That's another rule that we have. So you can't just like say, well, I think you know, that this is really important, you know, that we don't want you know, just op opinion television. It has to be community-led television. The, the second um, layer is the trainers. Or, or the NGOs, there's an NGO layer that I, I deal with a lot. And then there's the trainer level who are our staff, who are supporting each other and yet never, you know, they see each other in their training, but then they're out. So they have a Google group doing their own thing and they support each other. And they tend to type like they, like because they're used to texting, uh, uh, SMSing. So they type like they SMS. Ah, uh, you need help? You know, it's like, I'm like, you have a keyboard, dude. Like, you've got time, type the whole thing out. They're like, no. So I'm sort of learning from them about how you, you know, how you know, young, dynamic Indian people like communicate really sort of super quick. Uh, so we've got that, that training level. Then there's the, um, the media groups who we're involved in to help us you know, pull this off, um, at both at the local, national, and international level, at the distribution level, like the current TVs and all those guys as well. So there's these multiple layers of people who are trying to feed in that we don't really control, but we try and just create a, a, a mechanism by which people can ramp in, add their value, and ramp out. Um, you know, our goal is to have between 50 and 100 of these set up and regularly producing within, you know, the next three to five years. Um, the last piece that I'll throw in there is sustainability. Sustainability is really important to us, that, that we're not just funding the creation of these things and giving out equipment and, don't, you know, people have to have skin in the game and the NGOs have a lot of skin in the game. They put a significant amount of capital in with us, pretty much an equal share of capital. But the, C the community video units themselves are, yes, they're earning money, but they're also, you know, we, we, we teach them right up front. You know, you have these new skills, you have equipment, you have like a voice in the community. How can this become financially sustainable for you? How can this become an industry for you? And you don't have to tell people how to make their life better. You know, I, 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 what would I know about living in a village and making money in a village? Or, you know, at least being break even or half break even. They'll tell you. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll let you know. And you know, t just two quick stories about that. Uh, one is wedding videos. Um, if you're an untouchable or a Dalit, as, as it's known in India, um, no one wants to make your wedding video. And it, we all know how long a wedding, a wedding goes in India. You know, it's like a week, two weeks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and no matter how poor you are, you still want a video of it. It doesn't matter, you know, even if you don't have a video VHS player or a DVD player or a VCD player, you still want that because you'll go to a relative's place or whatever and you've got it, you've got it, it's your record. Because the wedding is your biggest expense in your life, ever. It's your largest capital outlay that the family will ever do. So no one wants to video these things because another Dalit doesn't have, typically doesn't have the skills or the knowledge how to do it or the capital. Upper caste don't want to touch it, literally. You know, they don't want to have anything to do with it, so they charge a lot. But they also, there's a situation where in the middle of a wedding, uh, it come to the meal time, uh, the upper caste filmmakers just put their stuff down and the whole wedding has to stop. They then have to be transported to a restaurant where they eat and then they come back an hour later, pick up their cameras and then start again because they won't touch the food that the Dalits are serving. So, you know, horrific problem and just jaw-dropping situation but to me, this is massive opportunity. How many Dalits are there in India? 180 million? Yeah, about 180 million. I see that as a massive financial opportunity for us because there's a massive market that people are prepared, obviously people are prepared to pay something for, but that no one wants except for other Dalits. So we've got like this ring-fenced, protected um, marketplace of a very highly desired product that no one else wants to do. So I'll take it. Thanks very much. We'll, we'll take that. So we've experimented with different models and it's, and it's great. I mean, people are really enjoying it. And they do this in their downtime and in the weekends and stuff like that. In fact, one of our uh, community producers has actually started up a little school for wedding videos. She's like, I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna teach other people how to do it. So she went the level higher. And she makes money teaching people 
how to make money, you know, how to, how to do this. And she said that her students make a lot more money than she does, which is very frustrating to her. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but that's, that's, you know, that's uplift. I mean, I, didn't, I wouldn't have expected someone to then go on and do that, but that's incredible. So this, uh, the second thing is there are two million NGOs in India, at least. Um, and the opportunities for reach are, are like, it's critical that, you know, they get to multiple numbers of people. And so we've experimented with um, uh, these community producers producing basic training videos and basic communications videos at, you know, just a, at, a, at a moderate price, but, you know, as a way of just adding to the, to the mix so that they can, you know, p at least to a part, facilitate their own salaries, their own you know, longevity, and show the community just how much value they're adding back into the community and their voice is adding back into the community. So we're really concerned with like social network theory, we're really concerned with leveraging knowledge, we're really concerned with um, technology and how you know, allowing people who are off the grid to get on the grid and vice versa. Uh, and as you can tell, when, when it doesn't exist, we tend to like build it or, or come up with a way that it's possible and very simply to build it. Um, uh, we, we're in India now, solely, but we are very interested in breaking out into other countries as well. Um, that's us in a nutshell, but you know, I'd love to, uh, there's a lot of you that I would love to, to and I will follow up with, uh, you know, in terms of partnership and in terms of, you know, leveraging our knowledge, uh, you know, and your knowledge as well. But if there's anything that springs to mind, you know, question-wise, I'm happy to. When you talk about setting up a unit, what's the average cost of putting together one of these programs? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, okay, I'll jump into my NGO spiel because, you know, this is the, exactly what they say. Um, it basically costs, in India, where we have an office in Ahmedabad and we have staff there, so with, with appropriate infrastructure, so it's a big caveat. In a country where we're already working, it costs us about 60,000 US to set up a community video unit. And that's a one-off kind of cost. And that breaks up to something like $10,000 worth of equipment, $10,000 worth of local labor, $10,000 worth of $7,500 worth of travel, um, you know, $10,000 worth of international labor, um, you know, it's things like that. It's, pretty, it's a pretty basic breakdown. Um, and, um, and then, but the ongoing costs are going to be close between seven and a half to $10,000. And the reason I'm hedging is because we found that um, our community video unit in Andhra, this is the tribal group, they have to travel like 20 miles just to get to the community video unit. So their travel costs are really high. And depending on what the cost of their travel is, that's what is actually our number one expense. We found our bud on the budget, it started quite low and then has gone to the number one slot. Um, so depending on travel. So that's roughly, does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. What about for communities in the US? We've actually done, uh, we, we, when I, we did the two years of hybrid testing and we did one in Harlem and it was moderately successful. The bang for your buck in the developing world is just so infinitely higher than the bang for your buck in the US. And that's not to say that there's not a need here, there's absolutely a need here. In fact, uh, the woman that I mentioned that teaches wedding videos, she actually uh, writes a lot about caste and does a lot on the caste system and, and prejudice. And she went to Mississippi um, and talked to the African-American community in Mississippi as a film. To, she presented a film, but also documented the film. Uh, very sharp young woman, and uh, came together with the groups of uh, activists and um, experienced uh, African-American people and very poor African-American people as well. And the similarities were you know, shocking. And, and there's obviously a, a critical need there. We're not sure really at the moment how to, how to tackle that. You know, um, it's much more expensive for us to set something up in the in the in the U.S. than it is to set something up. It's it's really funny. The the whole logistics change, the cost changes, and the impact is much lower. So it's it's really difficult. And I would love to know what the the keys to unlocking that are. And I would love to talk to you more about that because you 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 know you have a lot of experience here. Yeah. Um, so after you have these. Yeah, I mean, typically, although it's, it is early days for us, the, the first C, uh, uh, round of magazines has just been finished, so I'm getting like the reports every other day on what the screenings were like. So, uh, and we did test this in the last couple of years, but for, from a, an amalgam of that, what I can say is sometimes there is a great dialogue at the end afterwards, and sometimes there's nothing. 
Sometimes there um, is a program in place that's like, yes, sign up here on the dotted line. Sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes the NGO is very active about already, you know, getting the community to participate, and sometimes there's nothing. Um, and uh, what we want to see is a couple of months of this happen, sort of, you know, kilts up here. You know, a couple of months of this happen, and then say, okay, this NGO is not participating in a way that's really conducive to getting the community involved. So, what's happening? What's blocking that? So we're concerned with the, again, concerned with the governance processes, but not very agnostic about, you know. What, what the community video unit chooses to talk about. Because I think that you know, their, their idea is that the, the subjects they talk about have to be community-led as well. They have to actually survey. We've created a, a very simple survey that they have to ask the community when they're interviewing, what would you like us to talk about? Um, and in one instance, uh, this, this month, the first magazine was on electricity, roads, and water, like in infrastructure. And, um, it was fantastic because it was our first big success story. There, it was monsoon season and uh, this road was flooded out and uh, the, the, the weir had broken and you could just see and people were like up to here in water and walking across. It was the only road between two villages. Cars were having problems. And so they were interviewing and they were interviewing people and like I can't go to school and we can't go to work and the vegetables are rotting and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, the next week this road had been fixed and we, they interviewed the government as well. Anyway, then the road got fixed, which is, you know, if you've ever been to India, it's a miracle. You know, that's an absolute miracle. Um, and so we interviewed this guy, and you couldn't have paid this guy, you know, to say this. But they said, what ha what's happened here? And he said, well, the road was broken, and we're having all these problems. Then this media group came along, and then all of a sudden, they the government fixed the road. And it was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much. That's all you need to say. You know, it's like, I mean, that's what we're looking for, these little moments of, like, impact. Because uh, as we were talking about, you know, measuring this is going to be really, really interesting. And we're, we're fascinated by yeah, our own performance measurement. Um, we do th on the metric side, for those of you who are interested in metrics performance measurement, we're looking at what you can count and what you can't count. So you know, how many films were made? How many hours of footage do we have? How many people, how many um, screenings did we do? How many people from the villages actually turned up? Um, uh, you know, how, and we even measured really anally retentive things like how long did it take you to set up at the village? Because we really want to try and get that into a really slick, efficient machine, you know, where people just, they promote, they turn up, it works, the stuff works, the electricity's there or the generator's there and it just all happens so, people, so that it allows people to just participate rather than struggle to participate. Um, so we measured that, but we also measured the things that are very difficult to measure like what happened as a result of you know X? So we're trying to get baseline information up front, and then we're trying to measure that over time as well. Um, but that's uh, that's you know you know how difficult that is. Yes. Yeah. Brainstorm question. Uh, my my morning thought was, could we do something uh, in mainstream media, a cross between uh, Survivor World and America's Funniest Home Video? <laughs> in Survivor World theme would be people who are surviving and doing things that are positive and life affirming yeah. and, and capturing that in some either game or, or contest format, I don't know, uh, or species, a species that's surviving might be another interesting theme. And America's Funniest Home Video of playing uplifting clips and maybe uh, capturing on YouTube or something. And play. I, I saw in Times Square mm -hmm. last night the, uh, the dance routine where the guys are on the, uh, um, the, the walk treadmills. Treadmills. Yeah, treadmills. Yeah, the treadmills, yeah. yeah. So I think that started on YouTube. Now I'm watching it at, you know, um, it's a music video. Time yeah. yeah. It's, a music video. it's a rock music oh, video. Oh, it, it came out as rock video yeah. first? Okay. Yeah, it was. Oh, okay. But it's so become very viral. You know, people have been trying to imitate it. It's not so easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of teenagers at home with, like, twisted ankles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chiropractor. Anyway, the idea is, is, is there some way of capturing these videos, either professionally or even much more grassrootsy, mm. you know, back to the cell phone camera of a woman who did a savings-led microfinance group in Mali, talking to her friends into a video camera and sharing that in their language and their place. And uh, uh, when I was in Oaxaca last uh, February, I talked to some people about media, and they say there's like 18 different languages within 30 miles of Oaxaca. People will listen to anything in their native language, right. no matter what it is. No, and it doesn't matter how long it goes for. Yeah, and you so there's, there's, there's a lot of connections and glue here. And is there any way of taking all these videos and these ideas and all these neat stories and bubbling them up into a contest or whatever, having people vote on the most uplifting story in India? I don't know. And then uh, coming back up into a, you know, uh, America's Home Video or, or, or Survivor 
game or something like that. Is there any, any juice to that idea at all? Well, you're certainly tapping into things that matter to people. You know, I was li listening, really, and taking notes on what you were saying before. And I'm a big fan of the, the network theory stuff as well, as you know. Um, but, you know, I was writing some of the, com the com what I like think of as the compellers. What makes people watch stuff, like whether it's on YouTube or, 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 or you know, in India. It doesn't, I don't think it really matters. I think it's universal. I, and, and please disagree with me. This is, you know, but I think things that are funny work really, really well. People will watch them. Things that are shocking are really popular uh, for all the right and wrong reasons. It, it, th that would be the case for all of this, actually, right and wrong reasons. Things that are sexy. Um, Things that are amazing, uh, and I would put the hugs guy in the amazing category because there's nothing amazing about a guy in Pitt Street, Sydney, holding up a thing saying, I want to give you a free hug. But when he does it for a year or two years and he gets 10,000 signatures and people fight him and he fights back, <coughs> that becomes kind of, that's what the story is about. It's not just, you know, because if he'd done this a year ago, people would be like, so what? The guy's giving out free hugs. You know, it's like, but the fact that he, the story tells this, it's a story. You really, he's a protagonist and, you know, he's done something amazing. Just like you know, some guy on a BMX bike going over a jump or something is amazing. It's just, it's, that's why people watch it. It's like, have you seen the guy? You know, have you seen Chris Bliss and the juggling thing? You know, it's like, if you've not seen that, that's amazing too. I mean, some of you, I'm sure, have seen that, where he does a great juggling act to a Beatles medley. I mean, it's stunning, but um, it's just because he did something amazing, not because Chris Bliss is particularly a great juggler. He's not, but it's it's a wonderful thing. Um, and then the last thing is self-interest, which is it's it's, you know. It, I, I like radio-controlled cars. It's about radio-controlled cars. So I'm naturally interested to it. I'm Gujarati. It's Gujarati. I'm naturally interested in it. Or it's local, or it's informative in a way that s interests me, which is, of course, a much smaller group. There's not a lot of, that I could think of off the top of my head, there's not a lot of other universal attractors to content that really draw people. Um, and I would put things like disaster and shocking. You know, people love disaster. It's shocking. It's, well, it's not, and that's my point. Happy Uplift, that's why groups like us have to meet and try and un un unlock things because typically, like, I, I, again, I think that the Happy Uplift guy, the Hugs guy is not, a ha it's coincidentally a Happy Uplift story, but the reason it's, it's there is because it's an amazing story. Nope. <laughs>